Well, once more, it's a great privilege to celebrate Easter together. Today, even though we are meeting online or in smaller restricted gatherings, we can still rejoice together in the unchanging truths that Christ really died and really was raised back to life again. 2,000 years on, despite countless attempts to eradicate Christianity, billions of people have not only been inspired by the Easter story, but they have personally experienced the power and the presence of the risen Christ. And of course, I'm one of them. And actually, with every passing year, Christ has become more real to me. I believe more than ever the words that were spoken by the empty tomb Matthew 28, 6 says this, he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. For sure, I do not believe that this is all a myth. I believe that it really happened as the gospel accounts say it happened. And of course, in this, there are many writers who have given their reasons for supporting people like C.S. Lewis, who we've heard about today, others like Lee Strabell, a former investigative journalist with the Chicago Tribune who wrote a powerful book from his journey as an atheist to being a Christian called The Case for Christ, which is now a movie. But the most compelling reasons for belief, however, are not intellectual arguments, but seeing the power of Christ at work in real people's lives in the real world today. So many people, in fact all people, need a power beyond themselves, beyond yourself, to live the best life. Maybe you already know this. You know many challenges in your life. Maybe you need a power over fear, over addictions, depression, destructive behavior, dysfunctional relationships, or negative circumstances that just seem to pull you down. Possibly you can even identify with the sentiments of a lady that Dr. Cho, founding pastor of the world's biggest church, met. And she said to him in a very angry way, don't talk to me about heaven and hell. I am already living in hell. Well, the good news of Easter is that God can lift you up out of whatever pit that you are in and bring you to a life of conquest and blessing and fulfillment. And the best way that we can learn how to do that, how to be raised up, is by following the example of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, the Apostle Paul, who himself dramatically experienced the power of the resurrected Christ, tells us very clearly how we can do this. He wrote in verse 5, let's read these words uh, together. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here we see some very powerful lessons about how we should relate to one another as brothers and sisters in, in uh, all our relationships, but also how we can live with the same mindset of Christ Jesus. And each of these lessons will help to elevate our human relationships and interaction and bring us to new heights of blessing from God. Okay, here we go. Lesson number one. If you want to be raised up, what's the first thing? Humble yourself. Jesus Christ was the king of all, but he humbled himself in so many ways on earth. He was God but he came to this world as a servant, not as a boss. 
Let's read this verse again from verse 6. Who being in very nature God, he was God, but he didn't consider quality with God something to be used to his advantage. That's on earth. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. The Bible has many, many references to the awfulness of pride and the awesomeness of humility. James chapter 5 verse 6 says simply, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pride is the top of the list of seven things that God hates. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 says, here are six things God hates, and one more that he loathes with a passion. What's the first thing? Eyes that are arrogant. Next, a tongue that lies. Hands that murder the innocent. A heart that hatches evil plots. Feet that race down a wicked track. A mouth that lies under oath. A troublemaker in the family or the community. Humility, in contrast, is one of the great keys to spiritual revival and restoration. We know this verse, many of us, to Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Whenever people turn from pride, their ego, their self-justification, and they humbly turn to God, then God will bring great healing and also salvation. The great bishop J.C. Ryle said this, the surest mark of true conversion is humility. Humility, of course, was perfectly modeled by Jesus. He was born in the most humble of circumstances. He subjected himself to the limitations of the human body. He taught that the least valued, like children and the poor in spirit, would become the greatest in the kingdom of God. Jesus made clear in Matthew 23, 12, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In other words, the way up in the kingdom of God is the way down. Humility was the very core of Jesus' nature and character. He said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus repeatedly told his disciples not to be like the usual religious leaders, the religious folk who were so preoccupied with their own position and their own image. Instead, they needed to be ready to humbly serve others. And to prove the point, he washed their feet. And finally, to serve and to save all humanity, he renounced all his rights and endured the humiliation of crucifixion. As an old song by Noel Richards says this, You laid aside your majesty, gave up everything for me, suffered at the hands of those you had created. Jesus gave up everything so that we can experience every blessing, but we ourselves also have to know what it is to humble ourselves. C.S. Lewis, we're giving him a few quotes today, but as C.S. Lewis said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So, key one, to be raised up, to be humble. Key two, to obey God. It says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Say obedient. Obedient to what? To death, even death on a cross. Obedience is one of the greatest keys, actually, to knowing the blessing of God in our lives and our relationships. Disobedience to God and indeed to God given authorities brings trouble. From creation, the first man and woman did not obey the simple commands of God. And this resulted in great pain and many curses and separation from God. 
all through the Old Testament history. It's a history of prophets and priests and kings calling on God's people time and again to walk obediently in his ways. But time and again, they came trouble and strife because of disobedience. And when King Saul tried to cover up his disobedience with some very religious sounding talk, the prophet Samuel famously exposed his hypocrisy. 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23 said this, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, for rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Well, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? But obedience really is a key issue in our world. It's a key issue in the church. It's a key issue for our lives. It's a key issue for our families. A world or even a home of rebellion is a world and a home in trouble. One of the most popular songs today, which defines a lot of contemporary attitudes in our culture is this, I did it my way. Now I'm not gonna sing it for you, be glad about that. But for all the fame uh, it's brought him, Frank Sinatra himself didn't like the song. In fact, his daughter, uh, Tina said this, he didn't like it. He, in fact, he came to hate it. He always thought that that song was self-serving and self-indulgent. Well, even Jesus didn't do it his way. From early years, he was obedient to his earthly parents. He always did his heavenly father's will. And he taught his disciples that they must obey as he himself obeyed. John 15, 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Obedience was at the heart of the command of Jesus to go make and multiply disciples. Matthew 28, maybe you remember the disciple bit, but listen to the full context. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now we remember that, but he also says this, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The ultimate example of obedience of Jesus was seen at the end of his life on earth for he became obedient even to the point of death on a cross. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus went through a great struggle to be obedient. And three times we know that Jesus prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. This moment when Jesus fully surrendered his will to do the Father's will was the defining moment of breakthrough for the whole world for all generations. Because of the obedience of Jesus, we can be freed from our sins, we can enter the kingdom of God and be raised up to enjoy a new life of blessings with Christ. Now let me ask on this Easter Sunday, are you at heart an obedient or a disobedient person? Do you obey? Do you honour your parents, your church leaders, the governing authorities in our nations? Above all, do you obey God and God's word? Now, it's one thing to say I've given my heart to Jesus, but have you surrendered ever and daily your own strong will? Have you passed the Gethsemane test? Can you say in the words of the old hymn, my stubborn will at last has yielded, I will be yours and yours alone. When you do this, you and others will be raised up to new levels of blessing for God will always exalt you when you are humble and when you are obedient, which leads to my final point, that what you need to do to really come to Know the blessing of God in a new way and at a new level. Number three, make Jesus the Lord of your life. 
when you and I come to the Lord in humility and obedience, God will work a miracle. In fact, many miracles of resurrection in your life, just as he did with Jesus. Now see what happened here when Jesus humbly obeyed the Lord. It says here in verse 9, Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, God permitted his only son to die, but he didn't permit him to stay dead. For God raised him from the dead with great power, and he has made him Lord and ruler of all things. There is no other name in heaven on earth like the name of Jesus. And the day is coming sooner than we imagine when every knee shall bow to Christ in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue, every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord to give the glory to God the Father. But you don't have to wait to then. Today, you can bow before the risen Christ and confess him as your Lord and as your Savior. Let's pray. Whatever situation you are in today, have no doubt that Jesus is alive and he has the power to raise you up to a new life, a life of new possibilities, a life of new blessing. The old that has been with you for so long can go. Old sins, old habits, old addictions, old problems, old rebellion, and the new can come. New forgiveness, new freedom, new hope, new start, new life. If that's what you want, I'd like you just to bow your heads and pray with me today. Lord Jesus Christ, I really believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you really lived, you really died, and you really rose again from the dead. And today I'm asking you, please forgive me for all my sins. Please forgive me where I have been proud, where I have been stubborn, where I've been disobedient to you. From today, Lord, please give me a new heart and a new nature. From today, I surrender my will to you and say, let your will be done in my life, Lord. I ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you know, when you pray like that, it has tremendous um, effect. God hears and answers your prayer, but it starts a work in you where your nature begins to change, your attitudes become to change, you become a different person. The hard heart has a soft heart instead of a heart of stone, as the Bible says, it becomes like a heart of flesh. And so you need to not only read your Bible, start with the Gospels, but do what it says. And go and get right maybe with people that you have fallen out with or offended in some way. Do what you can to be humble and obedient in your lifestyle, but in everything, just put everything in your life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we can help you if you contact us in your desire to grow as a disciple.